now deeply honored to invite Bernard-Henri Lévy to address us. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Klug, Mr. President, Ambassador Lauder, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just arriving a few minutes ago, a few hours ago from France, from my dear, wounded, bereaved, and nevertheless standing up Paris. As you can imagine, till the last minute, till yesterday, I was wondering if I will attend or not this meeting. I was with my family, with my friends, with my relatives in this city in state of shock, which is Paris. It was for the Parisians of today, we are in the same situation as the people of New York 14 years ago the people of Egypt a few days ago, people of Lebanon, and people of Tel Aviv, since weeks and weeks having to face a state of constant terror and to fight these, uh, these stabbings, which happens every day. So I was in this mess till last night, but of course I decided to honor my engagement and I came to address you with all my heart. I've not prepared anything. I will just express a few remarks with my heart and all my, my emotion. First of all, I want to tell you how moved I am for the first time, I think, in my long career to speak in Johannesburg and in South Africa. You have to know that for a Frenchman, a French writer, but a Frenchman is in general. South Africa is really a very, very important place in our hearts. I remember in my life of activist, as Mrs. Klug said, I waged so many failed battles, battles which did not succeed which sometimes turned into their contrary. South Africa is one of the fights of my generation, which we waged and which, I had, which we had the sentiment to see won, to see in a victory. For me, for my generation, Mandela was such a hero Frédéric de Klerk was such a great man. And the day when apart apartheid was such a shame. And the day when apartheid fell was such an unprecedented and maybe unfollowed victory. And not only for the French, not only for a writer, but, by, but for a French Jew. I was so proud 20 years ago. I was so proud a few minutes ago when I landed in Johannesburg to remember how in this battle which you waged, how many Jews, prominent Jews, were at the front line and at the core of the battle as Ambassador Loder recalled and reminded just before me. There is a famous quote of a very famous Czech philosopher, Jan Patoka, who, who made a whole theory about the solidarity of the shaken, of the victims, of the, of the, the shaken, of the victims. There are, f there are very few examples in recent history of a real active and victorious solidarity of the shaken, South Africa is one of these examples. That's why, since I am here, I am so moved and so happy. 
So second thing I wanted to tell you, again, very simply and with my heart, is that I cannot prevent since weeks, maybe more months, a feeling of great uneasiness as far as the fate of Jews is concerned. And as far as anti-Semitism, which is one of the topics of your gathering of today, is concerned. The, the, the danger, of course, is everywhere. And what happened in Paris last week shows it again. No community, no city, no country is out of the danger and is immune from the hatred of the new terrorist, the new fascist, which are the jihadists. Nevertheless, I feel since some time and in a growing way that there is something going on around the Jews, around this question of anti-Semitism which is really concerning. It's not really the number of acts of anti-Semitism. Maybe there is more, maybe there is less, and even if there is more, it is not a question of quantity. The real thing which happens and which I feel personally so much is that the wording, the way in which anti-Semitism expresses, the way in which it tries to legitimize itself is knowing um, a new form since some time. I have the complete belief, I believe fully, that the first question of anti-Semitism through ages, since centuries, is how to express itself in order to be more accepted and maybe acceptable and in order to gather under its dark and shameful flag, bigger and bigger number of people. There was a time, once upon a time, where the good deal for anti-Semite was to pretend that he was revenging the death of Christ. There was a time, once upon a time, where the purpose of an anti-Semite was to try to demonstrate that if he hated the Jews, it was because opposite. The Jews invented the Christ. It was the anti-Semitism of the time of enlightenment. There was a time which began with Kristallnacht, where anti-Semitism, the core of it, was the racism and the idea that Jews were hateable, deserved to be hated because they represented a new, uh, an, an old, uh, a different race, and so on. There, there has been throughout the history various forms of legitimation of anti-Semitism, which each time made it more efficient and more operative in the brains of weak people, probably. All these forms of legitimacy have been destroyed and have been discarded, discredited by history. The last one, racism, thanks to Nelson Mandela, thanks to Frédéric de Klerk, thanks to the people of South Africa, thanks to President Jacob Zuma. This way of thinking, racism, still exists, of course, but it will never make again a mass movement. We will probably not see against the Jews big riots, big movements under the flag of racism. The story of the last decades have discredited that as they discredited the Catholic anti-Semitism, for example. What we have to face today is the growth the appearance and the growth, and for the moment, not the victory, thanks God, of a new system of legitimacy of which we have to be fully aware and to which we have to be very attentive. If I had to make it in a few words, I would say that the only 
way today to put again the fire in the brains and in the hearts of the anti-Semites of today or tomorrow, the only way is to lean on three simple propositions. And there is no other way. Number one, to say that the Jews are friends to, accomplice with, a terrible state, a, a colonialist one, maybe a fascist one, some say, which is Israel. The anti-Semites of today are not, it is not that to be anti-Zionist is to be anti-Semite. The only way to be anti-Semite, the only way to try to put shame again on Jews is to say that Israel is not a legitimate state and that the Jews are close to this illegitimate state. Anti-Zionism is the first necessary pillar of the new system of anti-Semitism as it takes shape. But it is not the only one. If they, they, the ugly battalion of the people of hatred, if they could demonstrate that the martyrdom of the Jewish people, the one, the martyrdom which is still an open wound in the heart and in the soul of every Jew in the world, whatever the generation, if they could demonstrate or pretend or insinuate that the martyrdom which in part, in a little part, but nevertheless, has been among the events which made Israel possible. I mean the Holocaust. If they could say, if they could insinuate the idea that Holocaust, some of them would say, did not happen exactly as the historian pretends, Others would say that it is an old story and that we have to let the dead bury the dead. Others would say that there is so many crimes f uh, all along the history. Why to stress specifically on this one? If they could banalize, minimize, and I don't even speak of uh, uh, deny the Holocaust. And if they could demonstrate that the Jews are definitely these infamous people who use um, a martyrdom, a memory, which is partly a fake. What a bad portrait of me, of you, of us, and what a chance for the anti-Semites if they could put this blame off us. That's why denial of Holocaust is the second pillar of a possible, and alas, of a growing anti-Semitism today. The third pillar of anti-Semitism, the third stone without which the machinery would not work, and without which, hopefully, it will not work is what I would call, in opposition to the, shaken, to the solidarity of the shaken I mentioned before, is what some ideologists try to call today, since a few years, the rivalry of victims. This is the third pillar. It is an old story. It has to do, by the way, also with South Africa. Remember Durban, Durban, Durban the first when the, the old topic was to say that the martyr people of today, the doomed and the damned of nowadays, are fed up with the Jewish memory which that overshadows their own suffering, that overshadows their own martyrdom. There is this tendency in France, in Europe in general, all over the world, and sometimes in America, to say there is no, not enough space in a human heart to breed, to 
different sorrows, two different mornings. You have to choose the blacks or the Jews. You have to choose the victims of uh, colonialism or the victims of the Holocaust. There is this third phrasing, which would be, if it succeeded, the third pillar of the terrible machinery. Stupid argument again. You are the embodiment here that it is completely absurd. The South African people is the living expression, vibrant, that you could be at the same time anti-racist and anti-anti-Semite. America in the 60s was also the vibrant proof that you could be a Jew honoring and mourning your deaths and be on the front lines of the battle of the civil rights. But nevertheless, there is a strong movement today to tends to say, who tends to say that there is not room enough and that you have to choose and that those who do not want to choose, those who continue to worship the Jewish deads are terrible people who deserve for this to be despised and hated. So, if anti-Semitism has had to come back one day, which I hope will not happen, if it came back, it would be on the, these three pillars and no, no others, which are anti-Zionism, denial of Holocaust, and rivalry of victims. Each of them, as itself, is like a ticking bomb in the world of today. The three of them, if they were expressed together, would be like the devices of a huge moral nuclear weapon which would breed, feed again the old anti-Semitism in a new face, in a new wording, and like a new virus. This is the danger of today. This is what we have to be aware of. This is what we have to be watching around us, these three signals. We can, of course, there will still be some racist anti-Semites who will believe that I have or you have some different genes. Okay, they will be a minority. Those who believe that we have to pay for the death of Christ, probably they still exist, minority. If anti-Semitism has to become again a, a real mainstream movement, it will be based on these three proposals and I fear, I think, no other. I want to add the last word because I'm here in South Africa and because it has a special resonance here. One of the movements which is on the saddle of these three horses of the possible new anti-Semitism, one of the movements that for the moment is beginning to assemble these three threads is the movement which is called BDS, Boycott, Disinvestment, Sanction. Why do I want to end with that and why do I say that, especially here, it seems to me quite topical and quite essential. Of course, these people of BDS pretend to be partisans of peace. We know that it is the contrary and that all of them, at least their most vocal ideologists, are in favor not of the two-state solution with Ambassador Lauder exposed, but a one-state solution. Go to the text of Mr. Barghouti, of Mr. Albunima, all the founders of the chart of 2000, the signatories of 2005 of BDS are clearly in favor of a one-state and a Palestinian flag, of course, solution. This is rather well known. What is rather well known also, but which has, that has to be stressed on and on, and it makes me so, it, it pains me, and it makes me so sorry when I see some young people 
I told to Mr. Lauder before in San Francisco, youngsters in the campus of universities and in France who don't see that. BDS pretends to be a democratic and anti-fascist movement. They should know. We should recall them. You should remind them. You know what is fascism and what is anti-fascism. That the origin of BDS, the first time in history when the strategy of boycott, disinvestment, and sanctions was worded, was expressed, was in December 1945 by people living at this time in Egypt and Syria. They were, if I dare, if I can call them like this, refugees, but it is a very beautiful word for these terrible people escaping the uh, uh, Germany of this time. So former Nazis and Arab Nazis of this time expressed for the first time the slogan, the imperative, the strategy of disinvesting, sanctioning and boycotting the product of what was not yet Israel, but was the Yishuv about to be transformed by resolution of United Nations into a state. We should remind to these ignorant people that their so-called anti-fascist movement, which consists in marking the products in the supermarkets of West Coast of America, and Europe with a yellow, a new yellow star that this strategy of boycotting has a genealogy and that this genealogy goes and remounts to the darkest time of the history of Europe and of the relationship between Europe and the Arab world. The last thing which makes me so, so sorry and so angry at the same time is when these advocates of the boycott movement pretend to battle against a new apartheid. And that's what I wanted to say here on this stage, in this room, in front of you. You know more than anyone what an apartheid is. You know, President Woman, you are the living embodiment of the heroism and of the fight of those who defeated the real apartheid, how can they dare to call apartheid state a state in which the Arabic language is the second official language in the country, a country which is the most successful multi-ethnic society which I know with South Africa, Israel. Our dream in Europe of a well-achieved multi-ethnic society, where is it embodied except in this strange country, Israel, where you have Europeans, Americans, Russians, Arabs, Kurds, Turks, and so on. A well-achieved multi-ethnic society. How dare they? call this a society of apartheid. So for, I wanted to say that here. I wanted to address through this hall, through all of you, I wanted to address to those who pretend to fight for democracy and for peace and for anti-fascism in the name of BDS, that they do all the contrary and they are the useful idiots of a new fascist wave. I thank you.